Hey everyone, it's DTM. I'm here with Doug and Jenna at the Kauai Pharmacy and we're standing under a tree that is significant. Why? What, why is this tree significant? Well, we moved to Kauai uh, about eight years ago and um, we had left the East Coast with the time we were living in Connecticut and uh, we had came here for many reasons. Um, but anyway, um, we'll get into that story in a little bit. Four years later, we found this noni tree. Um, at the time, Jenna and I were making noni leaf tea out of uh, wild harvests uh, throughout the island, and um, we were selling that in some of the local health food stores. Um, but anyway, Jenna had uh, pulled down this road I'll about tell a story. five years ago. Okay, I can tell the story. please. <laughs> um, I was driving my. At the time, we had a little baby. And um, that was our first child. We have three children now. And um, as most moms know, sometimes it's a little challenging to put your little one to sleep. So I was driving him around and um, I was kind of a little bit nosy and I was going down some other driveways off the you know main road because in Kauai, there's basically one road that circles almost three quarters of the way around the island. And then there's these offshoots. So I ended up on this offshoot road and follow down this path and this is the very path right here and I'm driving and I'm driving and I see actually at the time there were three noni trees here it's been a while now and um, they were positioned like one two three and we were sitting at the top of our um, what now is our farm but at the time was uh, somebody else's farm and uh, I was like I called Doug and I said hey Doug I'm like oh my gosh I'm like this is this I just found this this farm here there's these three magnificent noni trees at the top of the drive and there's a for sale sign and I'm like there must be a noni mecca down there and at the time uh, the fence was closed and all I could see was down into this really beautiful valley and there were horses in there and it was really spectacular I was like oh it must be a noni mecca down there and then um, Somewhat, uh, some time later, after we did acquire the land and we went down there, there wasn't a single noni tree on it. However, now there is. We uh, are planting and, uh, and uh, a lot of love. We have uh, designed, a obviously, an herbal uh, plant medicine farm, of which we now have several varieties of the noni leaf. And this plant um, attracted us originally. A lot of people we knew of were using the fruit, and Jenna and I did some research uh, with regards to the leaf, and the leaf to us was more attractive. Um, one, more abundant. Two, wasn't as seasonal. Uh, seemed like the um, ancient Hawaiians and, and all throughout Polynesia, uh, they had used the leaf as external wrap, but also to make teas out of. So, and the fruit is kind of, um, although very potent and amazing medicine of all, you know, in, in many ways, it's kind of gnarly. Um, <laughs> as okay, far as there we it's, go. Um, <laughs> It just. This is an unripe fruit. Yeah, it tastes. Give you a look at that. It's been known as like, it's been called like the throw up fruit. Anyway, vomit um, fruit. the vomit fruit. It yeah. definitely makes you kind of. Uh, anyway. It smells like rotten cheese when it's in its. Um, the, when it's in its more. That's the that's the state you want it in. This is perfect. When it's nice and tender like that, where you can like smush into it. And if you open. I'll take that. If you open it up, there's all. I'm gonna use that topically. Little seeds. Oh yeah, that stuff's just amazing. Make sure there's no. No. beetles or anything in it yeah. but yep no this is perfect that's the better part so this mushy cool. noni is what you really want um in the fruit and this was known as um canoe food or medicine uh -huh. and um in polynesian times they came over to the islands um we're on the oldest island and um they can only carry with them their food and medicine and supplies and seeds that would fit in their canoes and they had these amazing outrigger canoes and one of the plants that were um, aboard those canoes were the noni. And um, they were very intelligent because it's a great famine food. They didn't know if they were going to settle somewhere with food. And it's also uh, very good for like if you have like intestinal or parasitic things happening. So you don't know where you're going to end up. Antifungal, um, antibacterial. This, this stuff is basically... Um, medicine of all kinds you can use it topically internally digestively so they were really intelligent and they brought this over um it's also the only plant that i know that has the seeds that are can withstand the buoyancy of long times at sea so like they basically it can withstand salt water 
and um, and also long durations of being in the ocean. So what happened was the seeds also came here through the ocean and planted themselves up onto the shores. And then due to the volcanic soil here and the nutrients in the ground, it just proliferated. And you can find noni trees wild in Kauai, in all of Hawaii actually, um, along the waterways for that reason. And we were fortunate to get introduced to that early on in our stay here. And um, it helped us on many, many, um, oh my God, how many things did this heal for us? <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things, when we were drinking the teas, we used to call it the truth serum um, because so many truths were coming out um, in our personal relationships um, that were rising to the surface. So finally, things I think that we were holding in for a long time were, were finding their ways out for you know, and and they and we were like, wow, did you just say that? I didn't say that. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I said um, that out loud. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> did anyone hear that? <laughs> so the story goes, um, we were on Kauai for about three-ish years, um, and Jenna had rolled up here, and we saw the sign, and we we're like, wow, that'd be amazing. Neither of us had ever farmed or um, owned a, a piece of land on in this jungle environment, which is certainly um, a huge responsibility to take on. At the same time, we were pregnant with our second. Jenna was pregnant with our second. And um, so we were getting prepared for that um, experience and to have that baby. And we were staying at a place down in Aniti, which is a, um, about, about a mile from here. And um, it, that, in that um, location, there was an existing herb garden of about uh, 15 different herbs. And um, we got a little tour through the garden with the landlord. And I said, and she showed us all the different herbs. And I had my phone with me and I was plugging them in. And then that night I did a bunch of research. And I asked her, what do you do with these herbs? And she said, uh, you make tea. And it was perfect because we were already making noni leaf tea. So I said, that's perfect. I said, do you make tea? And she said, no. And that's one thing I have learned also is just how prevalent and, and how these plants are everywhere on the island. But um, like these leaves on the noni leaf, it, on, the noni leaf on the noni tree, they don't get utilized. This medicine is growing at our feet. It's growing in all the trees. Things like soursop trees, which are in a lot of our blends, you know, they're um, known for colon cancer and things like that. They're all over the islands, and same with papaya leaf, and I mean, even you see the coconuts falling. You know, they're not being utilized. So we came from a background um, of somewhat entrepreneurship, and we were came to this island. And when we get to this island, you're, you're there's so many ideas, as I'm sure Dan knows. So many ideas uh -huh. come up, and certainly this idea, uh, you know, never kept coming up with us, which is how do we utilize all this abundance? How do we utilize these leaves that no one's utilizing that are that can help so many people? Um, and in any case, uh, my background was at the time in real estate finance. That's what I was doing for throughout my 20s. Um, and Jenna was doing industrial design. Uh, we were both on the East Coast, kind of tapped into... Uh, I didn't even know what a noni leaf was. Um, I didn't even know really, you know, I, I, I had intuition about how to self heal. I thought I knew what I was doing to heal myself. Um, and then I came here, I'm sitting here with a leaf in my chest. <laughs> I should explain myself a little bit. Um, uh, when you pass a noni leaf tree, it's customary to uh, take a leaf and put it on your heart. And it's supposed to promote healing and well being. So I'm doing that on behalf of everybody out there. Um, and for my own internal health and healing. And it's an evolutionary process. But yeah, I was in a totally different genre, whole, whole different world, whole different diet. I mean, I was eating a completely different diet, living under a stressful um, work environment in a very busy city. Uh, we lived on the train tracks next to a nuclear power plant, <laughs> across from a coal plant, right? I mean, like, literally, um, you know in the heart of it that's like three strikes one, one, one you know studio apartment with like one window and you know we really we took a leap coming out here we came out here with uh with backpacks and um and our son our newborn and as amateur parents it was kind of bold we didn't know anybody and uh we just came out here and we trusted in the process as you probably know here dan you know like you come here and it's just a different vibration you know you you go through your day and these things come into your life like and if you accept them and you inquire and you um, 
are accepting to like learning about them versus uh, having the aversion to change and want to stay familiar, you know, I think that you realize that you're, this island has a way of, um, of embracing you. Yeah. And, um, or it could go the other way. <laughs> um, I've seen that happen to many people too. And I think um, we were very open and trusting and young and just, just uh, trusting enough that uh, we were able to do a lot of healing really quickly and learn a whole lot um, experientially really, really fast. And, um, you know, and then there's always the book study stuff that comes, you know, we, we did it backwards uh, to what some would normally do where you have the botanical knowledge and you'd book study it and then you go and find the plant and then you practice with it. Well, our philosophy, and I don't think this has changed very much, is that we meet a plant, we experience it, um, you more than me, because you have no filters whatsoever. Doug has tested and tried every single plant on our farm and then some in every orifice of his body, and we'll just keep that at like a too mm -hmm. much information video, um, and uh, internally, externally. And since I was pregnant for most of our uh, stay here, I was either pregnant or nursing, you know, I had some filters as to what plants I would dance with. So, um, you know, I found my love for my certain plants and I got my experiences and I'm constantly learning as we are as a family. Now I have children who need, you know, tending to. And so now I go to the books um, and I learn Oh yeah, okay, that was my experience. But that's why that happened. Okay, now let's see what I can do if I combine these two herbs and so on and so forth. But um, anyway, want to go and I'll start it with the noise. Like, yeah, let's show them the come kind of the panorama Welcome. here of the. I'm gonna show them this big old juicy noni. <laughs> awesome. Most people ferment that and they make it into, a, it, it, it extracts an amazing potent medicine as well. That's it nice. We our, use it topically. It's in our pure tea and it's also in our wellness tea. Um, so as Jenna was talking, the um, point about experimentation is like you think about, you know, everyone has potential fears out there. And um, one thing that after Jenna's, Jenna gave birth to our first child, um, it kind of put us in the, the Western medicine world and we realized how um, little responsibility we were able to take for our own well-being. Um, and it was, it was kind of uh, scary, actually. Like it was programmed out of you? Yeah, it was exactly. I mean... To rely on someone else? Everything from our own self-healing, but as, as simple, I shouldn't say, as animalistic or as humanistic as childbirth you know, is something that's not taught to children today. And you can go through 16 years of, of you know, school education and go on to college and graduate school, and you really don't learn much about childbirth, which is something that... Until after you're pregnant. Or health. And right. then you're like, oh my God, give me every book in the planet, and you become the most studied person in the world, trying to kind of... But you only got nine life. months to do it. Yeah, and, exactly. and even the people that are outside of you, you know, trying to give you support, it's not part of the culture, you know, as, as is, you know, in many cases, herbs aren't part of the culture. So it's interesting because um, we're kind of new to the social media thing. So um, when we're talking about part of the culture, this is the culture where we came from. But um, in many parts of the world, there is more of an acceptance. There's more like of a um, underbelly of teaching through, like I know in Holland, it's really, really accepted. You know, the government actually subsidizes midwifery. And um, it's, it's definitely more accepted and, and children actually grow up with that experience. But where I come from, um, which is the Northeast um, in the United States, um, that's kind of, you know, all I know is from the TV shows. And I remember watching as even a little girl, the mama going down with her big belly on the gurney screaming, ah, ah. And next thing you know, the doctor's delivering the baby and everyone's like, it's a boy, it's a girl and everything is fine and, you know, and that's just all, it, it was a panic, emergency room um, drama is what was conditioned and embedded in my brain. So here I am going into my first child. That's my education. That's all I knew. And um, it, what it does is it kind of desensitizes you to um, relying on somebody else to tell you when to push. 
if that's even the right word, because, you know, in my, my intuition now, I've, I've had some experience, I've had three totally different births, um, you know, I, I don't think it's about pushing at all. <laughs> in fact, I think it's about breathing and breath. And um, my easiest birth was my third one because I finally felt my own body and let that go. And anyways, why is this all important? Well, because our first child was a lot of the reason we're here. We really couldn't tap into uh, a subculture even um, on the mainland that would allow us to birth a natural birth um, within like what our wishes were really and and the support around us as well as you know having i mean it brought us all the way to buying and and growing our own herbs and this is where we just gave birth um to our third child and um it was on like right overlooking the, the herbal garden of medicine beautiful um, it was what it was what birth should be and what every mother should know it exists i mean I went from having, I'll give you the background, a quick, quick little one, two, three. My first birth um, was everything opposite of what I was looking for, and I ended up in a cesarean. And for those of you who know that, that's a pretty traumatic surgery. And I went through the medical system. I went through the gamut. I went through the hospitalization practices, um, policies, all the litigious stuff that goes along with that. And I felt trapped. I felt violated. It took me probably two years of meditation to come to terms with that birth and all the aftermath um, and healing, uh, which scarred me so for a long time. So violated by Western medicine and, and the, the butchery it. that it can sometimes. And, and at the same time, yeah. appreciating that we had not taken responsibility for ourselves. You know, we had put that out there and we were subject to the powers that be that were in theory responsible for us. So we had not gone through our own education, gone through our own experience. And the same thing goes for, you know, healing in, in this day and age. You know, if, if you have pneumonia or bronchitis or you, you're, you sprain a wrist, where are you gonna, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna take responsibility for yourself? And, and the doctors that you do seek out, are they exemplifying good health? Are they exemplifying what it is that you're trying, where, where it is that you're trying to go. And that's one of the reasons I think we were attracted to you, Dan, is that you do exemplify good health and you are on your own journey. And that, to me, I, I don't believe or not believe in, excuse me, in, in doctors or Western medicine. What I believe in is those that exemplify what they say they teach or what they say that they stand for. And if you exemplify it, then I'm all ears because that means that you know, you have you have your own experience. So um, getting back to... So my second birth, um, which ended up being here. So my first birth brought us here. <laughs> and we were like... To okay, heal. What's that? To heal, essentially, yeah, the traumatic almost like, experience. Yeah, like subconsciously to heal, because um, it was really deep-rooted. And I, I didn't realize how many layers that onion had to peel back, to get myself back to whole again. And... Um, so when my second child was coming along, I thought, okay, here we go. We're gonna have the birth that, we're gonna, we're gonna set the tone for this birth, right? Well, uh, Mother Nature had other plans for me and she wanted to school me further. And um, one thing is, if you had children or if you're planning and having children, uh, it's the most humbling, most empowering thing that you can do as a human being. And um, I don't mean just women out there, I mean families and, and men, you know, and, and children that are involved in that because um, there's no control. And that's a big thing in our society. Everybody wants to control. I mean, you can go, I mean, Dan, you probably have this all the time with dietary thing. It's like, okay, I counted all my calories. I checked this off my list and I'm going to control how many sit-ups I do today. And, you know, and, and, and nature is not like that, you know, and, and when you try to control um, the powers that be, quite frankly, in the most basic of terms, you're going to get spent. That's when you're, that's when you're and hurting that's your back when, doing the sit-ups. Yeah, know? and that's when you're going to get the most out of life because that's the biggest lessons. Those are the biggest. When you can fall hard and learn quickly, you can lift up and rise and, and become, you know, stronger and more empowered. And I feel like my second birth was exactly that. I went into it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do the midwife. I'm going to do the 
home birth and oh, oh okay I know the red flags are all going out there in cyber world right now because uh, yes I had a c-section first and then I went for the home birth right and everyone would say oh you can't do that that's a VBAC are you gonna do a vaginal birth after cesarean that's really risky you're high risk um, I didn't believe that I didn't believe I was I felt very strong and um, and I felt healthy and I felt if I was healthy enough to get pregnant I'm healthy enough to have this baby so I did and I went and I had um, some complications uh, that, that arose afterwards, some major complications that put me on my back for two months. That's a really hard thing to do when you have a newborn baby is to be on your back for two months. Thankfully, I have the most amazing husband in the whole world and I owe you a cape and I'm going to buy you one one day because um, mm -hmm. he did. He was my knight in shining armor. and. He mentioned that we had, uh, our landlord had planted this amazing medicinal herbal garden, which was like literally 30 feet away from the bed. I was on bed rest with my newborn baby. And um, just so grateful for those times um, because he was bringing me, my blood count back up and just, you know, helping me heal with all these herbs. And I had experience with this guy, I had a lot of experience with the noni leaf, I had a lot of experience with um, uh, different types of herbs but from like packages and far away imported stuff that really is completely different than if you know your source and you know the plants that you're getting it from and who um, harvested it, how it's prepared, what soil it's in. It's a, it's a whole other ball game and I now know that. And I wouldn't have known that if it wasn't for this experience. So I could babble on and on, but mm -hmm. the long and short was that he single-handedly held it down and he healed me with these herbs. And at the same time that that healing was taking place, we acquired the farm. And I was still technically on bed rest, but I really wanted to see this farm. So the boys, uh, my youngest and, and Doug would bring me back little snippets every time they come back with some gardenias or some pua kini kini flowers or just something to brighten up my day from the farm. And then finally I snapped and I said, okay, I want to see it already. I want to see it. And I was well enough. And, um, and then the rest uh, kind of fell into place. We came here and believe it or not, the very first plant that we planted was a start from that same Tulsi plant, from that original garden that healed me was our first plant that we planted here at the farm. Really so when did you know plant. that, did you know that you wanted to grow herbs before you bought this land or did it come a little bit after that? Well, my, I had mentioned that my landlord gave me that tour and then I jumped online to do some research. This was only now five years ago. So um, what ended up happening for me is I, I had like a closet filled with supplements of every extract and vitamin that you could find and um, as, I, as we mentioned we were on Kauai looking to heal and I was out there like I'm sure a lot of you are looking for the next new new thing um, and I was spending all kinds of money um, on it and stuff was going bad in the closet and other stuff in the fridge and um, but I was I was moving up a ladder and, and getting more um, closer actually to finding the real thing for at least from my opinion. So when I got to that garden um, and I started making teas, all of a sudden this this um, voyage that I was on, this journey that I was on, when I when I that I when I came to the island, I was, you know, biking a little bit and was trying to surf and do yoga and I I was getting all kinds of third party help from acupuncturists and masseuses and I was certainly open to it all and things were happening, but not to the extent I was looking for and I'd look in the mirror and I was still kind of stiff and my three-year-old at the time was still walking all over me <laughs> doing circles around me and and you, I'm sure some of you know what, you, what I mean by that like you never imagine yourself not being able to keep up with your children um, that's kind of the dream is when you have these children you're able to to run with them um, so he was only three and he was doing circles around me um, so I was about 20 pounds plus over the, the, where I was where I am now and in the Western world that's not necessarily considered very obese. overweight yeah or obese or anything but for me my neck was stiff waist was you know not really that's happening. a 20 pound 20 pound bag of dog food that you're carrying with you 24 yeah. 7 and it's it's a, a it's a stagnation <laughs> it's a stagnation right and it happens and then your organs start to feel it yeah and then you, you know 
everything gets stagnated in your in your digestive system. So what happens every couple of months? Your back goes out, right? Because which actually is why we were turned on to the noni leaf. Right, because I was using it on my back. My your, lower back. your lower back. So was I was fucking, heating the leaf right. up and putting it on my back. But that was happening periodically, and it's one thing after another. And certainly, you know, nutrition's a big deal. And but there was something that, and I was moving in those directions, but there was no nothing lifting me that I could rely on. And that's when I started drinking the teas. All of a sudden, I was I was doing the hula. You know, my waist was moving finally, and I was like, wow, this is interesting. My waist is alive again, and my neck. My neck wants to move, you know, it's no longer stiff and it doesn't hurt. And I felt myself losing weight and I felt myself losing weight naturally as well as being attracted to better and better food. So that's a process too. Just, I shifted my diet thinking that, you know, if, if you know, I had fish and um, salad with a bunch of dressing on it and all these things that you think are really healthy for you, I, sh I eventually shifted it to yeah, there's, you know, for optimal health, there are no shortcuts. There's no, I can eat this tonight or I'm treating myself or, you know, those ideas in my head that I grew up with. Now my, these herbs were creating awareness in my body to say, this isn't good for me. It's just going to create a path that I don't want to be on. So um, in any case, I started to really believe in these herbs. Now I have nothing in my medicine cabinet other than the teas that we have here. Um, I find myself to be in more of a, um, you know, to sponsor good health and good living as opposed to being a, a space of, oh, it's hurt, what do I do for it? Because it's kind of too late, you know? If you bust your knee out because you're 25 pounds overweight, you can't fix that knee because you're 25 pounds overweight, you can't even exercise. It's kind of one and the same. People go to the doctors and get knee replacements because they're 25 pounds overweight. It makes no sense. Lose 25 pounds, don't get your knee replaced. So that's the mentality of, you know, to nourish the positive of or the positive being of your life through the herbs. Um, in any case, that's what brought us to this farm. Um, we can walk and kind of show you sure. where... What this is the true medicine uh, cabinet right here because we really don't have a medicine cabinet. Here. Right, no, it no, no longer exists. We, <laughs> we just brought a calendula into the farm. We were using calendula oh, cool. externally from time to time. Um, that was really... And, and what you learn from these herbs is, you know, they're, they work... If, if you do it in a preventative manner or in a lifestyle way, as opposed to waiting until there's an issue, um, they all work for everything because you're not trying to fix anything. Instead, you're just supporting your lifestyle. We got the guava leaf right here. We're passing. This is in so a bunch of our teeth. This is a leaf. Um, we use this in our in our purity. Um, this is a leaf in the Caribbean. They use actually for both purposes of stomach cleansing as well as to stop things like diarrhea. So um, a lot of our, our fruit trees, the history of them and the, using the leaves are more um, through indigenous tribes using them because that's what they have, right? They don't, they're not looking to import. They're not looking to find something that doesn't really necessarily live there. They, they use exactly what they have. Things like breadfruit or ulu leaf um, they use for things like diabetes. So they're utilizing everything they have. And that's one thing that we've done here, which is we're growing what grows well. And that's the gardens and that's the island telling us what we should be doing. Um, and if we listen to that, our job gets easier, more simplicity comes into our lifestyle, and then we can produce better and, and stronger medicine. This is a little raspberry tree that we just cut back. It's an infant. Um, this is what's in the women's wellness. Um, it was planted under here because it's kind of thorny, but we're about to move it into the garden. Um, Great for iron, um, great for uterus uh, this, is, this is a good one. This I drank a ton of um, after I had all my complications. This and nettles, really, really, really powerful for women who are pregnant and also women who are um, using herbs for postnatal healing. Love the raspberry leaf, love the nettles. Here we have the Hawaiian nettles. We use uh, mamaki, it's not the stinging nettles. It's a totally different uh, plant doesn't have those little, you know, stinging uh, feature to it. Super powerful. And um, anyways, yeah. So I, I do remember right before we bought the farm, um, ordering some of the more expensive herbs, um, things like the high-end ginsengs and stuff. And um, I remember comparing it just to our tea and realizing, you know, this medicine's got to get out there. Uh, and that's one of the major... Um, 
motivations in in finding or founding the, the medicinal farm that we have here. We can just step into the garden uh, briefly. Uh, just, and, and then uh, just on my personal note, you know, I talked about all the things that went wrong in my first and my second birth, but then I'm here and I'm on this farm and I am had my baby here and um, overlooking the ginger patch and uh, almost named my baby Ginger. Thank God I didn't do that. <laughs> Sorry if anyone's named Ginger out there. It's a lovely name, but um, would have been too literal for me. Um, in any case, um, the difference between my first, second, and third birth was that I had all these herbs at my disposal before. I had a lot more knowledge, and so when I went into it, I went into it with a preventative healing and uh, just a real healthy attitude and more of a, um, I'm going to trust my intuition on this one, and I'm just going to feel my body and, and kind of like let Mother Nature run its course and, do, and not control it. And I think that was like just the release. Okay, I'm just gonna let the, the you know. And actually, I use herbs to stimulate my um, my third birth. I actually needed a little a little jump start, and that ha helped me. Had the baby, and it was probably the most blissful, most amazing birth. I know that's hard to imagine for me too, considering my conditioning. Always thought that, you know, visual of the women on the gurney going down, you know, screaming. Mm -hmm. It was the complete opposite. It was a beautiful, lovely. Um, experience and it's something that I want to share because I really do believe that um, it was the most empowering moment in my entire life and it was allowing me to um, use what I had at my disposal use the resources and the land and and um, my past experience to uh, if you will like alter my existence to be one of a really positive and I feel like everybody can do that. Everybody has the power to self-heal. It's it's letting go. It's it's trusting yourself versus trusting a stranger. And yeah, and I'll just um, finish by just saying that's what brought us all the way here was empowerment. We started. We used that com that word a lot in this. Um, or self empowerment. Self empowerment. Yeah. And these herbs we're now shipping all over the world. And what brought us all the way here was seeing what's going on, knowing what we've where we've come from and realizing that we can send this all over the world and bring that self power empowerment so to how here. do we find the herbs so the herbs uh, are on our website is that and that question? is that is uh, www.kawaiipharmacy.com that's k-a-u-a-i f-a-r-m-a-c-y and you dot com and you're welcome to send me an email um, if you have any questions about it, because it is a process to learn about this way of self-healing. Um, and then hopefully we can create a culture that is empowered by these plants. Um, and this plant awareness and plant consciousness continues to rise. Well, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate this. Thanks, Thank you, Dan. Peace. Aloha. Aloha.